Yvonne Belcher. Yvonne Belcher was a 25 year old who lived with her husband, Jesse Andy Owens, her mother in law, and her daughter from a previous marriage on Highland Avenue in Green Cove Springs, Florida. She worked as a dancer at a Jacksonville establishment at night, and in the daytime, she worked as a server in a restaurant at the Cattail Creek Golf Club. The marriage between Yvonne and Andy was volatile. Both had been arrested on illegal drugs and alcohol charges. Andy was also arrested in March for beating Yvonne. On December 22, 2000, an argument broke out between Yvonne and Andy, and police were called to the house to end their dispute. Two days later, on Christmas Eve, Andy would report Yvonne missing. He said he had last seen her on the 22nd of December. He said he saw her walk down Highland Avenue at about 2.30 a.m. The temperature was at the freezing mark at that time of night. She was wearing a black and gray Jacksonville Jaguar sweater, blue jeans, and sneakers. One of Yvonne's friends told the investigator that that night Yvonne had contacted him asking for a ride. He arrived at Highland Avenue and picked Yvonne up just after 2.30 a.m. She then asked her friend to take her to an undisclosed residence several blocks away from Vermont Street. Her friend then waited several minutes for Yvonne to return to the car, but she never did, so he went back home. Another one of her friends reported seeing her walking along Vermont Street around daybreak that morning. This was the last time she was ever seen. When questioned as to why he didn't report his wife missing before, Andy said that his wife had a history of leaving their home for a few days after arguments. Andy was cooperative with the investigation into Yvonne's disappearance, and he was never considered a suspect in the case. An extensive search of the area, as well as of the surrounding area, did not produce any clue to her whereabouts. The police would receive some tips, claiming that Yvonne may have relocated to the Daytona Beach or Fort Lauderdale area to work as a dancer. However, none of the tips panned out. Yvonne's parents do not believe Yvonne would leave for an extended period of time willingly without contacting anyone. Andy died in November of 2004 due to an overdose of painkillers. Yvonne was declared dead seven years later. Police believe Yvonne may have met with foul play. Her case remains unsolved. Patricia Doherty Patricia Doherty lived with her husband and two children in Allenton Lawns in Talley. She worked as a prison officer in Mountjoy Prison for about six months. On the 23rd of December 1991, Patricia traveled to a square in Talley to buy some Santa hats for her two children. She would not return home that night. At the time, her husband thought she'd gone to work on Christmas Eve. The next day on Christmas Day, her husband went to meet her at her mother's house in Rathfarnham, as they had arranged before, but she wasn't there either. Realizing something was wrong, he reported her missing. Police did an extensive search but came up empty-handed. Months would go by and there was still no sign of Patricia. Then, on the 21st of June in 1992, Patricia's body was found by a man out cutting turf close to the Lamas Cross at Killikey in the Dublin Mountains. She had been strangled and her body had been left in a bog drain. She was identified by dental records and the rings she was wearing. The keys of her front door were lying next to her and she was still wearing her coat. Patricia's killer had abducted and murdered her and then buried her body less than a mile from her home. It was only due to a period of dry weather which caused the peat bank to subside that her grave was exposed and then found. Police believe Patricia had been killed and buried around the time she went missing on the previous Christmas. Despite an extensive investigation into her case, no one has been charged with her murder. Patricia's body was discovered in the same bog less than a mile away in the Dublin mountains where Antoinette Smith's body was found four years previously. Antoinette was also strangled and buried close to where Patricia's body was found. Both women looked similar as well and were of similar age. Many have wondered if the cases are linked. There have been no leads or suspects in the case and Patricia's case remains unsolved. 
Johanna Young. Johanna Young was a 14-year-old girl who lived with her parents, Carol and Robert Young, and her two siblings, Daniel and Emma, in their family home in Watton, Norfolk. On December 23, 1992, Johanna left her home in Merton Road, Watton, at about 7.30 p.m. It was a cold and foggy night. This was the last time Joanna would be seen alive. Her parents did not realize she hadn't come home until her alarm clock went off at 6 a.m. the next morning and there was no one to switch it off. At this time, her parents assumed Joanna had stayed with her friends or with her boyfriend, Ryan Furman, for the night due to bad weather conditions. It was only when she did not turn up for her paper round at 7 a.m. that her disappearance was reported to the police. Police immediately launched a full-scale investigation. Joanna was seen by multiple people between 7.30 p.m. and 8.45 p.m., heading towards and walking around the town center at Watton. Two days later, after heart-wrenching searches and investigations, a man walking his dog found Johanna's training shoes tucked under a bush in Griston Road, Watton. He reported it to the police. An extensive search of the area was launched, and a few hours later, Johanna's partially clothed body was found a few hundred yards away from where her shoes were found, in a water-filled pit. Her body was found face down, and it was covered in scratches. A post-mortem examination revealed she died from drowning and a fractured skull. A major murder investigation took place. Police searched the area around Griston Road, but did not find anything. They took plaster casts of Johanna's footprints and numerous other footprints and tire marks, hoping to find any clue of the killer, but they came up empty-handed. Police questioned people in the area, and the man came forward. He said he had been walking his dog at around 11 o'clock the night Johanna disappeared when he heard somebody stumbling in the darkness. The man then ran to get a torch, but by the time he came back, everything was quiet and no one was there. Johanna's boyfriend was questioned, but was quickly cleared as his friends confirmed he had been playing soccer with them when Johanna had disappeared. Ten days later, the killer had dumped Johanna's jeans on a hedge in Griston Road, but police still did not find any clues. Soon after Johanna's body was found, a cryptic letter was received by the Eastern Daily Press. The letter contained a stick figure drawing of a girl, a youth, a motorcycle, the date and time, along with a street name, Griston Road. Police believed that someone had witnessed the crime and was too afraid to come forward. A witness had described spotting a couple leaning on a motorbike at the end of Griston Road the night Johanna disappeared, just as the drawing stated. The couple has never been identified, but police believe the female could have been Johanna. Three local men were arrested and questioned regarding Johanna's death, but were later cleared. There have been no leads and no suspects, and her case remains unsolved. Paul Logan In 1993, 25-year-old Paul Logan lived with his family in Consett, a small town in County Durham, England. Paul worked as a delivery driver for the past two years for the Golden Flower Chinese Restaurant in Shotley Bridge. He had two children, and he had been with his wife for nearly 10 years. On the early evening of Tuesday, the 23rd of December, 1993, the Golden Flower Chinese Restaurant received an order for a Chinese takeaway for Blue House Farm. The owner told the caller that the delivery driver would have to call back in a few minutes to get the directions for the location. Paul would call the number and get directions to the Blue House Farm, located in Shotley Bridge. At around 10 p.m. after the food was made, Paul left the restaurant to deliver it in his cream Pugo car. Blue House Farm was about five minutes drive from the restaurant. Paul arrived at the Blue House Farm and knocked at the door. An old woman opened the door and told him that no one had ordered any food. Paul returned to his car and noticed the gate door of their farm leading to the road was closed. He got out to open the door. It was noted that the owners of the Blue House Farm had left the gate to their farm open that evening, and it was thought that it was open when Paul Logan had arrived, but that when he left, it was shut. Paul would not arrive back at the restaurant. About half an hour later, the homeowners of Blue House Farm noticed Paul's car was still at their gate with its lights on. 
the homeowners called the restaurant and asked why the driver's car was still at their gate for half an hour. The owner of the restaurant called Paul's wife, but she hadn't seen or heard from him either. Meanwhile, the homeowners of the Blue House Farm called the police. When police arrived at the Blue House Farm, they noticed Paul's car still in the driveway with the doors open, empty, and lights on. The police searched around the neighborhood and found Paul's body at around 2.15 a.m., about 50 yards from his car. He had been bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. The murder weapon would never be found. It did not seem like a robbery as the money that he had with him had not been taken. During their investigation, police found that a lot of people held a grudge against Paul. It was found that Paul's car had been vandalized several times in the past three months. Police believe that multiple people were involved in Paul's murder. The fake call was discovered to be made from a public coin box in Snow's Green, Shotley Bridge, just yards from the restaurant, between 8 and 9 p.m. The caller then waited about half an hour to receive the follow-up call by Paul. The police believe after making the fake takeaway order, the killer or killers waited nearby at the Blue House Farm, and after Paul had entered the Blue House Farm, they had shut the gate behind him, and when he returned to the gate to open it, he was attacked. A couple would later come forward and say that between 9.20 and 9.30 p.m. on the 23rd of December, while walking down Bensfield Side Road toward Snow's Green, they saw a man making a phone call from a phone booth with another man standing next to a Ford Fiesta XR2 parked nearby. The man in the phone booth was described as being white, about 6 feet tall, 30 years of age, muscular build, wearing a black leather jacket with a scruffy appearance and collar-length dark hair that was receding at the front. The man standing next to the car was of a similar build, with a black jacket and a scruffy appearance. Both men have yet to be identified, and Paul's case remains unsolved. Katrina Ploy Katrina Ploy was a 26-year-old woman who lived with her boyfriend, Grant Milgate, in Parramatta, Australia. Katrina worked for a defense contractor, Bellinger Instruments, where she had met her boyfriend. The couple had recently moved in together in an apartment. On the 17th of December, 2006, Katrina spent her day with her family at the Hawkesbury Races. Katrina told her parents that she had been doing some Christmas shopping and had bought a widescreen TV and new furniture for her apartment. At around 5 p.m., she said goodbye to her parents and headed home. This would be the last time she was seen alive. Just 13 hours after she left for her home, at around 1 a.m. on December 18, 2006, two men found Katrina's jumper, handbag, and a mobile phone inside the barrier of the cliff known as The Gap above Watson's Bay on Sydney Harbor. Katrina's 1998 blue Hyundai Excel sedan was found parked nearby, but Katrina was nowhere to be seen they immediately notified police. Police found Katrina's work clothes neatly hung on a hanger in the car's trunk. Witnesses claimed to have seen a man and a woman walking around the path at the gap around the time Katrina's belongings were found. An extensive search was carried out, but Katrina was nowhere to be found. Then, on Christmas, two fishermen who were in a boat in Watson's Bay, Sydney Harbor, found the body of a woman floating in the water about 20 meters off Lady Bay Beach. Police were immediately called to the scene and the body was soon identified as Katrina Ploy. At first, police believed that Katrina may have committed suicide by jumping from the gap, which is a notorious suicide spot. However, investigators were suspicious as her body would have to float against the current to reach the location where her body was found. A post-mortem examination revealed her injuries were inconsistent with the fall and her death was treated as a suspicious murder. It would later be found that Katrina had frequented Watson's Bay area in the weeks before her death. Witness accounts placed Katrina four times in Watson's Bay from late November to early December. A witness saw Katrina at a tattoo parlor on the Great Western Highway in Wentworthville in the early evening of the night she disappeared. Her sister, Tanya said Katrina had confided that she was interested in getting a tattoo, an idea so out of character that it made her laugh. 
Katrina had formed a friendship with the owner of the tattoo shop and may have been seeing him socially. In the month before her death, she made about 50 calls to the owner of the tattoo shop. The police questioned the tattoo shop owner, but he exercised his right to silence and said he had nothing to do with her death. On one occasion, while riding a taxi, the driver overheard Katrina talking with someone she was going to meet at Watson's Bay. Katrina's car was also recorded traveling east through Cross City Tunnel about two hours before her belongings were found. Katrina had withdrawn more than $24,000 cash from her bank account in the two months leading up to her disappearance. Her friends also stated that Katrina was being sexually, verbally, and physically harassed at Berlinger Instruments. Her boyfriend, Grant Milgate, who also worked at Berlinger Instruments, said that one colleague had sexually harassed her for years and multiple colleagues had groped her at the office Christmas party. Katrina's boss said he was unaware of any sexual harassment allegations. Katrina had apparently handed her resignation to Berlinger Instruments recently and had four days of work left when she went missing. Following her death, Katrina's friends told Katrina's parents that she had developed links with organized crime and that one associate of Katrina had told her father to, quote, stop digging, stop asking questions, you are dealing with very powerful people who will come after you if you don't. Katrina's friends had also been warned off. Police interviewed four other men about Katrina's death, but no one was charged. The case was subject to a coronial inquest in July of 2010. Her boyfriend, Grant, had previously made statements to police and was subpoenaed to give evidence at the inquest that Katrina wanted to kill herself. But Grant failed to appear in court on two consecutive days and the police issued a warrant for his arrest. After his arrest, he was brought to the court where he explained that he didn't know why she wanted to kill herself, but added that she was, quote, apparently unable to do so and had contacted a hitman to kill her. Grant said he had heard secondhand that Katrina had tried to shoot herself after being left alone in a room with a gun. Quote, she picked up the gun, put it in her mouth and pulled the trigger, Grant said. Quote, unbeknownst to her, the gun was unloaded. End quote. The inquest also heard that Katrina consumed alcohol and was under the influence of ecstasy before she died. The inquest ended with an open verdict, ruling that there were a number of possibilities about circumstances around Katrina's death. There has not been enough evidence to conclude that Katrina committed suicide, nor that foul play was involved in her death. Her case remains open and unsolved. 